Be excited about this life. <laughs> it's practical. <laughs> I tried to keep the same wording <laughs> for both of mine. So I'm Ken Eshelby. Uh, I work for the Open NMS group. Uh, if you weren't in the other uh, session or presentation I gave earlier. Um, this presentation is on syslog and how you can actually use it or a method to use it without uh, being overwhelmed but also getting the, the most out of the variety of messages that are available. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I like to do things that aren't necessarily related to IT. Um, variety of things. Uh, exploring the US is one of them and the world now uh, so I've been I've worked for about 20 years in public service for IT related things uh, mostly as a network engineer um, for the Oregon state of Oregon government uh, Oregon is on the west coast of the US just above California you don't know where it is um, this is Utah, so this is not Oregon. Oregon, more trees, uh, ocean, some desert, mountains, volcanoes. Uh, so I worked at Inanok for maybe 10 years, and then uh, the government built a data center, a medium-sized kind of data center, and uh, then at that point around, oh, I don't know, 2006, let's say, uh, I started working with OpenNMS and uh, implementing it for mostly network equipment, uh, but we had some other uh, servers and other, you know, power-related kinds of things that we also worked with. Um, my time got then split in network management and network engineering, uh, and partnering with other groups. We had storage, we had uh, security and ser different servers, all kinds of levels and sizes of servers. So there was some variety in there. Um, but primarily I focused on network related uh, management and, and getting information um, to whichever audience needed network related information. Um, so with, kind of with that in mind. Uh, the idea for this talk is to uh, make the most use out of syslog and try to eliminate excess. Um, network management is very hard because every situation seems to be unique and you need to decide what is important to you um, and what kinds of information you want out of the system. So that takes some work and it takes continual work to achieve that. Uh, this isn't a thing that you, especially with syslog, this isn't something that you you can figure and, and leave alone. You have to continue to uh, revisit. You know, I, in, in here I recommend weekly <laughs> kind of a revisit to make sure that you're catching uh, important information that uh, you may not have seen for many years. It may show up one day, you know. So you need to have a method. I believe you need to have a method um, to catch those kinds of things and then uh, integrate them into your workflow. And you know your messaging ins and outs and, and the different routing of, of messaging. So that's I'll try to describe some of that and how I approached it. Uh, there are worse approaches and there are better approaches to uh, what I'm showing here. So um, just focus on uh, what I'm trying to achieve uh, with, with this process. Uh, so quick, quickly, what is this law? We'll go through this. Uh, Client-server messaging protocol, it's standardized, it's widely implemented, um, and it's fairly simple. There are a few basic elements to a message. Uh, there are the five basic, there are more, but you know, these, these, these are the five major elements that make up a syslog message. 
Uh, this could be the most critical part of the message is the time. Because when things fire off, and when you have a lot of syslog messages, you must have reliable time or else any kind of any kind of deviation will skew your ability to uh, understand what is going on in your in your environment. Um, if if your time is off on one or many devices and they are part of a larger event, when you look at your messages and the timing of the messages, you won't know the order and you won't understand cause and effect very easily. So it becomes very confusing. Uh, you know, when you when you start working with, let's say, more than three or four devices, up to a hundred devices that, that have an event that occurs through them. So, time is very important. Look at that. Thanks, Windows. I'm not sure that I have a slide for this, but also, uh, well, I kind of do. I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, facilities are not rigidly assigned. They're they are required, and there needs to basically they're represented as a number in the syslog message. Um, and this is good because, well, vendors don't always follow standard convention, as you might well know with traps and being able to compile traps and so right. So there's various interesting interpretations of how things should work by many vendors. Facilities are a uh, number, what, 0 through 23, I think, something like that. And uh, you can make use of that variety for your purposes. So for example, by default, Cisco uses a facility called Local 7 for its routers and switches. And historically, it used local 4 for its ASA firewall type devices. So right there you have, and these are default configurations, right there you have possibility to uh, contain and identify type messages by a facility type. It's just a filter opportunity. So you can, you can take that uh, idea and apply it yourself. You, know, you don't have to go by defaults. Uh, here are the standard severities. Uh, these are loose. These are uh, fairly well mimicked in OpenNMS. Uh, not necessarily, but it's a similar kind of structure. Um, we are mostly concerned with uh, in a network management system. We're mostly concerned with uh, level zero through six. Debug is meant to be used with a repository for heavy duty storage and investigation uh, like like a log stash elasticsearch kind of setup that's meant to deal with volume open nms is not necessarily a volume uh, oriented system it is in the sense of how many things you can do but it's it's not meant to be a performant repository for lots of events or data um, in its database. It's not the intention. People do it and it can be done. So why should you care about syslog? Uh, this I found quite interesting. And uh, Clayton Dukes is a, a engineer that I think works for Cisco now. And this was a quote from one of his uh, presentations at Networkers. Uh, so you have 90 traps defined for iOS 12.2 and 6,000 syslog event messages. It gives you an idea of how much more information is, is available in the form of syslog than in traps. And the fact that traps, trap messages are duplicated in syslog first, as far as I've found so far. There are probably exceptions to this. So you can get much, much more out of, out of processing and routing and delivering syslog messages than you can potentially with traps. It's a, it's a quite a large benefit, and I used it uh, used it greatly at the at the job that I had previous to this. Um, I did a quick verification of this with the Junos 
uh, message definition, I guess is what I would call it. And so I, I looked at define traps and opened NMS and counted up to 199 and only looked at messages starting with A and <laughs> it's tedious, but counted, counted them and came up with 197. So right there, it's pretty much verification of, of what Clayton what Clayton uh, stated. So it's pretty amazing. I, I find this to be a pretty amazing fact that you have this much more detail. So to me, uh, I want I want as much information and data available as possible. But I want so in stating that I also have to have approaches to using that information in effective ways. So. To me, traps and syslog messages are equally valuable. Uh, you just need to work with both. And you know, it increases your workload. Syslog will definitely increase your headaches and your time, time invested and things like that. It's, it's, it's very costly from a time perspective, but it's also very valuable and it can save you time when you have an issue because it will it will uh, highlight specific issues much better than other forms of, of detailing issues in your, in your environments. That's what I found. This is a run through of all this Junos, uh, just the message types, not the detail of, you know, there could be two messages for each heading or there could be 30. So this is just an idea of the scale that's involved. And, and I didn't work with Juno, so I don't have uh, much understanding of what, what, these in, what systems these indicate, but uh, some of you might be more familiar with them. Here is a run through of what all is available. Um, and again, uh, 200 single trap messages versus, I, if you say 200 times 20 kind of a thing, you know, it gives you an idea of what, what's going on behind the scenes. What, what it points to me toward the level of effort the software developers at Juniper and other companies, because it seems to be a pattern um, dedicated into the two different systems which are, these are, those are the two most common ways of sending messages in OpenNMS. There are, there are others, but these are by, by and large the most commonly uh, deployed and the most straightforward to get in OpenNMS. So here we go through the different systems. Uh, some of them will be uh, mirrored, like there are some, I believe MIB, there's a MIB2D, Thing. So it's SNMP related. Uh, I think there was an SNMP, SNMP related. So this is this is generally where trap uh, mirrors or copies of trap messages would be found. Link up, link down. I think are in here, and so on. So so that's that gives you an idea. I think that was seven or eight slides of just the the high level grouping of the messages. Here's an example of, of one. So you can see as I, I expand the tree, uh, you know, the, the amount keeps going. It's not just what you see, but I'm sure it's probably 30 messages. And there's a description of each one. Juniper has this documented fairly well, or really well, actually. And here's the count of uh, what's in the OpenNMS uh, defined events, which generally come from uh, MIBs that contain uh, trap, trap event information. We compile them and turn them into event definitions. And I'm fairly sure these are all coming from that process. That's how I got that count. So the important part is that you may not know that something's wrong, um, and it may linger for a long time without you knowing. And 
the idea is to jump on this and know about these things before they actually hit you and cause an issue because in various industries outages have different costs in banking it's much greater than it is for uh, maybe education type of area so knowing these details uh, at this small low level granular level is uh, pretty important you know uh, in the service providing environment this these would be uh, important to me important uh, piece of your management system to uh, work with and get uh, elevated informationally to your technicians and engineers. The two criteria I use, uh, number one is a very, is probably the most important. Do I care about uh, the message? Is it something that I can address or is it uh, is it meta information that just surrounds the environment? Um, and has the event occurred before? Is it repeating? How frequently is it repeating? You know, what, what, are, the, what are the parameters around the context for the message itself? Um, somewhere in this is a decision of what to do with each of these types of messages. So these are maybe a couple of good questions to have in your mind when you are deciding what to do with this floodgate of messages coming into your system. And it's different for every environment, as far as I've seen. So let's uh, address uh, what to do about all these messages and come up with an approach that's maybe sustainable and uh, straightforward to work with. So here's the process, roughly. Your devices need to be configured uh, to send messages to your NMS appropriately, uh, and regularly, um, consistently. Uh, you need to do something with those messages. Um, you need to come up with a, uh, a way to classify them so that your NMS can then uh, deal with them. Then you need to send them to open NMS and then you need to work with them like any other event. Uh, so there's a rough list list that we'll I'll go into in, in more detail about. So for in the Cisco world, these are the kinds of configurations that you would do to be specific. For example, we used uh, for a lot of our routers and switches, we used uh, this local 5 facility instead of the default local 7. Um, I set up our VoIP equipment to use local 4. Uh, I used or local 6. I, I kept local 4 for our security related devices. That immediately lets you segregate incoming messages to your syslog uh, collector into different log files just for say historical purposes to have just plain log files that you can prep through and and search for different uh, issues that go on um, the other piece of, oh and by the way jump in with questions don't be afraid to interrupt because this might go fast and it gets deep I think it's all repeated but it, it's a lot of details for each each step uh, you, you want, want to have, have you want to have time related information in a regular way to display time that lets you parse the messages better quickly more efficiently uh, you don't have to have a lot of exceptions um, you want the messages for a device to come from the same interface if possible this is kind of where DNS and naming comes in you ideally want to have a really good working DNS uh, there's many factors in an environment that play into how well or how troublesome this this whole process can be. You need to have this, you have to work in a lot of different areas with a lot of different administrators or engineers to, to make all this come together. But when it comes together, it's a really good thing because it lets you fix things or identify things much more quickly. Um, Again, uh, you really only want to send informational level uh, logs and above. This says logging trap informational. 
This is just the convention Cisco uses to classify what level of messages, traps, or logging uh, to log. Um, and you can set up, uh, I think you can set up multiple kinds in a device so that you can show, you can do debug messages locally to the device and you can have a separate uh, level that you send off to your syslog receiver. And of course your NTP server. Very important. Servers. <laughs> it's very important to have working uh, time synchronization in your network. Very important. Uh, so, what I, so I was looking for a way to uh, do this initially just to um, understand better the load of messages that were coming in and correlate and uh, get them separated into different areas of interest. So there's, <laughs> if you go to that, the URL, campin.net, uh, he talks about stealing new log check. <laughs> he found log check. He modified it and named it new log check. So that's what I, you know, I mean, mine, what I ended up with is probably new new log check because I've modified it further to fit my environment. Um, it's what you do if you're not oriented to just creating something yourself. Some people are much better at doing that. Uh, and behind all this is the ugly regular expressions which you need to learn. There is no other way, I think, around this, this problem is you need to learn how to work with regular expressions. Pattern matching and parsing, it's just, that's life. Uh, there are tools to help ease it, but you still have to uh, understand how they work. Um, I open an enhancement bug with OpenNMS to make a included regex uh, evaluator part of the tool. I don't know if it'll ever get implemented, but I thought it was a good idea because you work enough with patterns within the tool and lots of pieces are being moved to the UI out of uh, editing XML that this becomes part of that workflow. Uh, evaluating reg X's when you're uh, dealing with notification filters or syslog uh, pattern matching and stuff like that. So maybe there will be one in OpenNMS someday. One noticeable difference I found between traps and syslog are that syslog requires a fairly specific uh, parsing to be successful at it. Uh, traps not so much because you're doing the troublesome work in the compiling of the trap. So the understanding of what the trap is is a function of the structure of, of MIBS. So a lot of that and <laughs> you can still run into trouble because vendors have different ideas of how a MIBS should be formatted. <laughs> so. You still can run into troubles, and it's a similar situation, but I haven't found it as much with syslog, but you still have trouble areas, and you have to deal with them in order to get uh, into useful uh, workflow. So you can, you can approach uh, parsing of the messages in, in uh, many ways. Um, come on in. I have one, one question. Um, the <laughs> OpenNMS probably it was in the next slide. The OpenNMS will send the syslog message with date, time, severity, something like that. OpenNMS parse partially this message, or if we don't parse anything, we will get a message with date, time, and thing like that. So yeah. that's why we need to parse, just to take out eliminate. To eliminate things you don't want and to uh, um, capture pieces that you do want to then be used as parameters throughout the system. And um, if I don't have an NTP server, it's not such complicated to have one, but if the date is mass, uh, could OpenNMS think about uh, the date and time when he receives the syslog messages and just put it in that order? Is doing this or date and time uh, turn into an event 
you could, it would be a separate function. I think it would be external to OpenNMS because uh, when an event is received, yeah. it gets a timestamp from the OpenNMS system. So and that's that, kind of the timestamp that's worked with. So no. I don't care what timestamp I get from the equipment, from the server that I'm monitoring, because it always gets a timestamp there. It will be ordered by timestamp. It could be, but there's some processing time involved, possibly. In a large environment, you have delays, you have slow links, you have different things. You know, this is mostly UDP. Yeah. So you're right, as, as events come in, it, it, so the, then the issue is uh, you make use of the timestamp from the message itself, which is a, should be an accurate reflection of when the event happened, or do you, do you take advantage of the time of when the event was received? Because I and it, don't and expect a, to have a 10 minutes delay from the... One you just have to know that when you're uh, using the working with the parameters at, in the events. I you know. have problems with messages coming in in the wrong order, though. For right. example, if it's UDP. Um, yep. So you, yeah, you get it's true. network down, and then afterwards you get the calls, for example, and they could be backwards. Mm, yes, but it's, it's a possibility. You can get into a situation if even you have an NTP server, nothing is perfectly synchronized. And <laughs> That's very true. You are in the same it's honestly a, uh, something that you would need to. Uh, come up with a way to determine the reliability of incoming messages. Yeah. Then you have some confidence that I don't have to worry about this, right? Uh, still, though, it's it's uh, fairly easy to set up NTP, but it is time and process, and it can affect your workflow, how you build the devices, all that kind, of, how you configure. Yeah, so so it's. Maybe better, maybe worse. So the the point here was that you can you can take the message and just leave it as it yeah, it is and stick it in, and OpenNMS will recognize uh, your severity based on uh, the default based upon the format of the message. Uh, it can recognize uh, the facility and it can it can generate generic events for these incoming. However, if you want to make custom events for different types of messages and turn them into alarms so that they can be deduplicated and, and up down paired with each other then you need to parse more so that you can create uh, you can create keys for that to basically you can you can create a keyword to use in the parsing of the syslog message within open NMS to identify it as a custom event and then work with it so that's that's kind of what I'm saying here is that parse as much as you need, um, depending upon your requirements. Um, but you have every option <laughs> to do what you want. There's advantages and disadvantages. Uh, here is in this in this what I would call pre-filtering phase. Uh, where I'm taking a syslog message and, and parsing it with the script, um, and this is a 24-hour uh, kind of cron run script. Uh, this is kind of the form that the parsing takes using the script. Uh, the, the messages are basically cleaned up, um, and a regular expressions are applied to first uh, remove certain pieces um, and and again so the goal of this script is to deduplicate so that you so that when you see because it generates a report and when you see that report you're seeing uh, correlated so you see you know a number and then the message instead of hundreds of that message uh, because you have things like process IDs that get put in into messages you have uh, interface names uh, you have MAC addresses, you have uh, various things that are unique and you want to strip those out so that you can just count them up because you're interested in, you're not, you're not, uh, and you're doing this for reporting. Again, you're not, you're not then sending this message on to OpenNMS. This is just an intermediary tool or approach to, uh, 
pre-process and identify uh, possible messages of interest. So this is what we're talking about in, in this realm. So this is the result, or this is some of the parsing that goes on. Uh, you strip, you're stripping out things that uh, you don't care about or that, that cause a message to be unique. So you're trying to, you're trying to muffle uh, the details of the message. You're just trying to identify types of messages. What are some of the types of issues that it had to deal with? Uh, process IDs were one. Systems will send, and you can control that sometimes on your, your uh, device, your host that's sending the message, right? So some of these things you can deal with ahead of time. That can be uh, advantageous or disadvantageous depending on your needs. But uh, So some of it you can take care of on the head end. Um, the access list, uh, Violet, the hype, so the port numbers and the packet counts were part of what the access list deny. I, I wanted to have one section that just ACL denies so that I could uh, use, and we used that in, not for OpenNMS, but for other reasons. We wanted just a general summary of access list, list violations, mm -hmm. right? To, so the security group could go figure out what's going on. But they didn't want every single thing because that was kept in more of a repository. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one case. As you work with this, you start to see where, right? So the ugly is you have to then go into the processing script and adapt to it so that you can you can generate a more efficient report, a shorter report. I had this down to where uh, I was getting, I think I had six or seven reports defined, and I was getting like a page or two a day uh, as a result of hundreds and hundreds of messages. We, we didn't generate a lot of messages, but it was a fair amount in 2,500 devices. You know, I ignored quite a bit, and that's part of this process. Uh, here's an example of a report. This is just for, uh, we had a problem with people would not clean up uh, native VLAN mismatches, and uh, there, was, there was another type of message in this report as well but I don't I don't see one but this is an example where you see um, you see a count right here how many times and it's times with an s I'm not sure how I missed that but anyways here's 162 times 161 times 863 times these are all space uh, lines separated by host so this is one host this is another host this is a third host so the report was very simplistic, but it basically highlighted that, hey, I've got some issues with this host and maybe the configuration of it or its partner, its neighbor, so I need to resolve, you know, either either I need to resolve it or get another technician to resolve it. Um, and this came in many different forms, uh, so it was six messages. Basically, I classified certain keywords as critical issues or critical uh, Areas of interest related to the to the uh, keyword filters, uh, BGP security, uh, which was more like um, SMP authentication failures and things like that. There was a whole other ACL because that gets really busy. Um, found is just kind of the catch-all. It's like uh, I would put keyword filters on each of the different areas and then. Then I would put in a, a match and ignore so that it didn't populate the found uh, report, basically, um, so that I could I could identify anything new coming in in, in kind of the standard report, or it was or I didn't care about there there could be an occasional duplex mismatch that shows up in the found. I didn't really want to classify it anywhere else, so it was kind of a, a to do homework report for the week or the day. So you can set this up in many, many different ways according to what you need uh, to do. Here is an example of uh, some of the keywords. And the keyword lists were just individual files. So I had, uh, I had some .ignore files basically where I would create lists of, of keywords that were used to, to be ignored. I don't want any of the ignores to show up in any kind of report. They, 
they uh, it it keeps it keeps it out of everything, so you don't see it. Because that's kind of the initial thing is when you when you see just a raw list of log messages, there's an overwhelming number of messages that you don't care about. So that's kind of the first thing you need to trim away so that you can actually start getting uh, messages that you can classify and process and work with. So uh, this is just an example of part of the, the critical keyword list. And you can kind of see these are having to do with, uh, here's power supply stuff. Um, this I believe was uh, kernel level kind of things. One of our wireless guys really cared about this, so I made it critical. Earl has to do with uh, generally ASIC level stuff and Cisco equipment. On and on, it goes on. Anything that had to do with temperature uh, or any kind of environment thing, that we considered critical. <laughs> we didn't want boxes melting. <laughs> so that that's the approach I took. Um, and so what you do, so then what you do with that, with your middle piece, is that I take the keywords generated and I created, uh, I created filters in syslog ng, which is what I used. It had a, a decent uh, filter matching mechanism. <coughs> and it seemed to, all of this ran on the same server. Um, later I migrated to another server, but that was more organizational than performance detriment. So. This seemed to be fairly lightweight because you 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 end up not dealing with a lot of messages per second kind of a thing. Uh, so I I made a keyword filter. Uh, I I gave that filter a source, which is the OpenNMS server, and I sent the message along to the OpenNMS server. All right. So now we're on the tail end of of things, um, and so. Effectively, you get to parse things all over again, because all you're doing with the the intermediary step is identifying keywords to use to then send along, because that's your filtering mechanism of messages sent into OpenNMS, right? So your your goal of of an intermediary intermediary process is to limit the numbers of messages coming into your OpenNMS system, because it shouldn't be a message repository. I have a slide from the other presentation that shows uh, shows a deployment that had um, 15 million, I think was the count, 15 million uh, undefined enterprise default traps in their database. And that's what you don't want to get to. So what I've been describing is the piece before it gets there so to limit the messages that come in. You're trying to help each system along as, as you work with it to get to the information that you want. So we have to parse this all over again because uh, in OpenNMS what I cared about was the host name and uh, what the message was and then I work with that. Uh, again, host um, is general. You can configure the the format of the. You can reconfigure the format of the message in syslog ng, so you can tailor it to what you want to send into the system. It kind of helps you along. I, our syslog I haven't worked with uh, very much, but it's it seems to be growing in popularity. But for for what I was using, syslog had ng had a lot of flexibility and things like that, where I could I could transform messages, and uh, it helped each step of the way out a little bit. Let's see, and so, so all I was working with in this config were the syslog uh, messages from Cisco. So normally it, with a variety of vendor equipment you would have a pretty big list of, uh, of syslog import files. Here's an example of, of two messages from the import. All it's doing is, is now I'm taking my keyword list and I'm assigning it to a UEI to create a custom event. Very straightforward. Here's the event uh, that I've, I've given some uh, alarm reduction keys so that uh, 
things like fan failures, uh, things that tend to be uh, repetitious, um, you decrease the event count and help your system along. Uh, but but that's 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 really the the nuts and bolts um, of taking a message in and doing something with it, so that you can then uh, you can then create your notifications and and your out your outputs and uh, you can report against you can do everything you can do with events in the system. This is this I'm showing as a default. Uh, syslog so you can you don't have to create custom events for each message you get uh, you probably won't be able to initially because <laughs> you'll get a lot um, so what this what the default syslog D events uh, definition does is it uses uh, facility and severity and it then creates a uh, generic and I the display I used was I just prepended it with syslog colon to identify that it was a syslog message. Then I could then I could filter off of that if I needed to and, and make you know you understood where it came from. Uh, and then the outcome, um, you know, you have so. What do you do with the message? Well, some you just store as events and you never do anything with them because maybe they are not enough. Maybe maybe they are uh, maybe they are messages surrounding it. So a, car, a line card failure in a, in a big piece of equipment. Uh, maybe there were things leading up to it, like something relating to power. Maybe I don't know a really good scenario, but you don't you don't necessarily need to do something with each of let's say ten messages that comes in because you only care about one that's the main thing. You know. But maybe you want to store all the other surrounding messages as, as just more uh, data, so that when you're looking at what exactly happened, you have those messages uh, kept in your database to search on and, and work with. Um, you can use them as because they're tied to a device. You can run reports against uh, event message counts and event message types, so that if say if you did prepend pre pre it with syslog, you could. You could search, you could run a report against it, and you could do a count. Hey, I'm getting, for a month, I'm getting a thousand syslog-related messages. I'm getting uh, 20 uh, other types of events. You know, And if that's in a report, you can look at it and say, well, what, why are all these syslog messages coming in? You know, and, and you can identify you know, top X type uh, message counts per device, you know, or, or uh, device total messages and then breaking it out into types of messages. So there are multiple ways you can you can work with this. Uh, one thing I did is this was in the other presentation is I I use these for uh, dashboard uh, alarm entries. So that is I believe start to finish yep yeah, of. The strategy, and that was a lot, and it's uh, time intensive and messy, but the outcomes are very, very good. Uh, I would tend to get a lot of people showing up at my cube when something bad happened and they weren't sure what it was. Uh, the internet is flaky, you know, things like that. And the internet of fl is flaky could result in 200 syslog messages, and. Ten of them could be very useful to diagnosing what the issue is, um, and they may not come in any other form because you haven't ever seen them before. So, this is this is really the power is the uh, the amount and variety of possibilities that come in through Syslog, um, and I have found it to be a very very good uh, analysis tool or analysis approach uh, to keeping an enterprise running smoothly. <laughs> you need all the help you can get. So any questions, any comments? You can do this you could do this with Logstash or some other kind of uh, tool. Maybe more effectively, because maybe you have people familiar with it. We didn't have we logged into log files and we grepped them for things and we looked at time ranges, right? And and in that case, just a, uh, 
a plain log file, there wasn't, you, you can actually prepend a local timestamp to it. So you could do some kind of sorting without having to rely on time. So there are ways you could do it that way. But for, you know, the first two years of the data center being built, we didn't have really time to come up with an approach to effectively deal with all the systems. We knew we liked them and we used them because we, we'd uh, use them as a regular course of use with the devices because you'd look locally on devices for things when something went wrong and you knew that uh, a router breaks or a switches in a bad way and sometimes the person at the remote office, if it's a remote office situation, they reboot the device and you lose your logging in the device. So we knew we wanted a, a log file locally to, to search through and look for issues. Um, but we didn't, we didn't go much beyond that. Um, and that takes time to look at thousands of messages to find something that could be interesting to you. Mixed in with many other messages that are mundane or, or really not useful. So I wanted a way to further uh, focus on interesting messages and get them into a get them into a form that then I could do more things with. <laughs> 45 minutes. <laughs> so any questions or comments? I think the idea is straightforward. The implementation is very painful. <laughs> Parsing I can is, back you up on the, the volume and yeah. because I have a system of work which is aggregating the MX and MTA logs using XIM onto one host. And it's a between five and ten million lines a day. Yep. And I'm in the process at the moment of breaking those out into MySQL tables in real time. Yep. So I can build a dashboard on top of it for our service desk. Yep. And once I got my head around the differences in the regex implementation, it was just a matter of repeating the lines and then restarting it, testing it, truncating the table, let it fill up, move on to the next one. Then some new exception, some new version of something comes in that changes things a little yeah, bit, well, you have to adjust. I set up my, my incoming mail logs didn't have the PID logged in them, but the outgoing ones did, so that threw it all into a yep. bit of a stick, so I had to rationalize that, but yeah, it's, uh, it's worth taking the time to do. It is. There are many ways to trip you up along the way of doing this and it gets frustrating, but I can say with confidence that it is definitely worth all the effort um, because in, a, in an environment that's, for, that's you know not small, um, you need to be able to identify details when things happen. And when you're dealing with the volume of messages, you need a way to uh, pull out the unique or the interesting things and classify them in some way. So. It, it pays. Can uh, can by default to assign a special severity like syslog severity to those kind of messages. I'm thinking, okay, we have too much there information are, from syslog. They're already in there. I mean, there are events in the default configuration along with the mess for, for every level and every severity for all facilities severity and severities. So do the severities come through as an additional parameter into uh, syslog config, essentially? They, they, yeah. Yeah, it's they part of the message. The, they get mapped to the severity and, the, and it's part, part of the uh, event. Right, okay. So it, 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 is so it all I, trumped together in the in the message, so I have to split the message out to get the severity? Or no, do no, I get no, a, no, a severity no, no, no. So, so if you have a, an informational syslog message, it would show up as a as a normal level message yeah. inside inside uh, OpenMS. It came in as a, as an emergency, it would show up as an emergency level. Okay. See this 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 gives part of the message itself as it built in. So is that mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah I'm yeah. um, very much how syslog ng works, it's just more how it presents itself within OpenMS, oh. um, if that's okay. Yeah. You have some configurability and you can do custom things. Like for example, I also use, uh, I take uh, notifications especially, I would take and uh, not wanting to send emails for a notification, but do something with them. See, a, turn them into a log. 
So I would send them to an XMPP conference room that was persisted as a time-based log, or I would send them uh, to a syslog, a local syslog itself, and I could call it whatever, I could give it a severity of whatever I wanted to. Um, it was just another destination path. So I could make up multiple, one for each severity level, send it, have it come out of OpenNMS as a syslog message, and and then work with it some other way. You know, so I mean, it's in and out, all kinds of possibilities. So probably past time to move on if you needed to go to the other the other room. Thanks for uh, paying attention and Thank you. being interested. <laughs>